You're welcome to grab a seat. I'm Ricky. I'm part of the team here at Urban Edge, and I have the privilege to bring the word to you this morning. Pastor Sean sends his greetings. He's in Johannesburg this morning. He's ministering at two churches, and he looks forward to being with you here next Sunday. And so you're going to have to just put up with me today. Okay, cool. So um, I'm just going to go straight in. If I can have my time, please. Um, We're going to go straight in. We're starting a new series today, and it's titled Reborn. The truth of salvation, the truth of salvation. And Acts 4 verse 12 says, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And we're talking about, okay, I'm glad some people know. We're talking about Jesus and it's his in his name that we find salvation. The message of salvation, or another word for that, it's a Bible word, but it means to be rescued, to be saved, to have relationship with God, is through Jesus, is so simple that it may seem foolish. And to the world looking and saying, like, how can you believe this? But yet, it's existed, this message has prevailed for over 2,000 years. The Bibles have been burned, people have been persecuted, you kind of think it would be stamped out, but it's still here today. And we are bombarded with thoughts and ideas that often go against the simple yet powerful truth. And during this four-part series, Reborn, we'll find out what it truly means to be born again. So as believers, we are doing this series because it's good to be reminded again, not so? We forget, don't we? We do forget what we've enjoyed in Jesus. We get used to the go through, we go through our motions, and we forget But also it gives us tools to share our faith. We must never underestimate that God brings people across our path. And so if you just pay attention in the next four weeks, He will give you some keys, some simple keys that you can use to share your faith. And those of you who are visiting, maybe you haven't been in church for a very long time. Maybe it's your first time in a church. Maybe you're kind of like, I'm trying to discover this Christianity thing. Well, we believe this might be able to help you to begin to figure out what Christianity is about and help you on that journey in discovering with God. And so this week, I want to speak about grace versus works. Grace versus works. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, and he said this. In the New Living Translation, it's entitled, Made Alive with Christ. He says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Can I get the clock, please? Oh, is it running? Okay, it's very small. Okay. Um, Many sins, you live to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. Uh, and he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to, notice that, all, all, no exception, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. So it's not got to do with, it's not talking about, our doings, our behavior. He's talking about our nature, okay? Verse four, but God is so rich in mercy. Isn't it good when the Bible has a but in it? But God, there's good news. But God is rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Note this, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Jesus Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who united with Christ Jesus. You know, if you want to know if God's good, you want to know what God's grace is like, you just have to look at Ed. Then you know. The grace of God. You just have to look at me, you know. The grace of God. Just look at some people, what God has done in their lives. And he says, that is the trophy of God's grace. That is how God operates. This is the God we serve. You just have to listen to some people's stories and say, only but God. Hey, Ed, only but God. He's pointing his finger at me. But it's true. Verse 10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do Good things he has planned for us long ago. So what's grace? I'm just going to give you a few definitions we find in Scripture and from a few other sources. But it's the loving kindness of God or unmerited favor, meaning God shows his favor to you without anything you have done to deserve it. That's what it means. It's God's forgiving love or the acronym grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. Have any of you heard this before? Okay. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God withholding what we do deserve, okay? The grace of God is absorbing the cost of sin, meaning He took on the punishment 
that we needed to pay. He paid the price on our behalf, satisfying the requirements of the law through Jesus at Jesus' expense, and then extends a hand of friendship and restores relationship between us and himself. He didn't wait for us to say sorry first because he'd still be waiting. How many times do you wait till someone says sorry before you forgive? Yet God didn't wait for us to say sorry. That's the power of forgiveness. And when we operate in forgiveness, that's when we find freedom. God extends a hand of friendship to you and me before we said sorry. It's a powerful thing. Grace is the generosity of God at work. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace to him, and it says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Bono, another musician in U2, he worded grace this way. He says, Grace, she takes the blame. She covers the shame. She removes the stain. It could be her name. Grace, it's a name for a girl. It's also a thought that changed the world. And then he goes on and he says, what was once hurt, what was once friction, what left a mark no longer stings because grace makes beauty out of ugly things. So why do we need grace? Because the reality is we can talk about grace and it's so good and so on, but if we don't realize we need it, then we're wasting our time. The apostle Paul in his letter, he begins saying, why we need grace? He said, you dead. You and I, we are dead. We're corpses in a grave, stinky, smelly, nothing we can do because we dead. He says that the spirit of the enemy is at work in our hearts and all of us are guilty. All of us are subjected to God's anger. The reality is this, the value of grace can only be determined by our need for it. The value of grace can only be determined by our need for it. An example of this is we go hiking up Table Mountain and we forget our bottle of water. That morning before you left, you didn't think about water. You didn't think water was an issue. You didn't even, it didn't even dawn on you that water would be important. But when you're halfway up the mountain in 35 degree heat and there is no water, guess what? All you think about, all you want is water. Is every step you take is water, water, water. Not so. We think, you know, we had this water crisis. We never thought there would be an issue before. But now we cannot but shower for two minutes and flush our toilets with gray water. And if we do anything else, we feel guilty, don't we? Because we realize the value of water. We only realize the value of grace when we realize our condition and our situation with God. And we can go through life blinded to our need for grace. And that's why John Newton says, I was blind. I was walking around blind. The scripture says it's like a veil of our eyes. We don't see. God has to pull it away and give us the revelation. Help us realize how we're walking around trying to satisfy ourselves or satisfy God by our own ability and our merits and doing things to rescue ourselves. But actually that nothing we do justifies ourselves. Nothing we do makes us acceptable. Nothing we do helps us gain acceptance but we go through life trying to fit in trying to be accepted doing stuff so that we feel that because there's something inside of us that draws us towards that that need to be accepted and so there's two types of people in the world today those who don't believe who they don't need grace because they're good they do all the things that God needs them to do and then there's those people who think they don't deserve grace because they're so bad why would God do something for them you know if you only knew my story you know God couldn't forgive me. I don't deserve forgiveness. Sometimes we think like that, don't we? God still offers his grace to all of us. And you know, in Romans 5 verse 20, for those of us who think we don't deserve God's grace, it says, the greater the sin, all the more grace abounds to us. That's saying like, hey, you are never too far away from God to forgive you. Your sin is never too big for God. He's bigger. His love's more. His love's greater. Maybe some of us kind of think, okay, I'll accept God's grace, but I need to pay God back. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll serve in every, every serving area. I'll be at every meeting. I'll go to everything just so that I can pay God back. And we might not necessarily think about that overtly, but in our behavior, it's almost like I need to pay God back. Nothing you do, nothing I do can ever pay God back. And that's good to know because it frees us then from this obligation of needing to pay him back. Others may say, what's the catch? This is too good to be true. What are you on about? This is, this is a trick. If I accept Jesus and I come into the kingdom of God, I'm gonna be stuck in a sect and they're gonna have their claws in me and they're gonna take all my money. And No, no, no. This is too good to be true. Yeah, well, this grace is good. And it's amazing. That's why, that's why we sing that song, that hymn, years and years later. Different versions of it, but it's still true. How amazing it is that it dumbfounds us. Maybe some of us are good people and we kind of say, I'm a good person. I've never done bad. I've never robbed anyone. I've never broken the speed laws. I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. I give to the poor. I do all these things. By what standard are you good? Yours? In comparison to your neighbor, you may be better. 
But in comparison to God's standard, none of us meet it. That's why Jesus came and said, you know what, if you desire a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. You've not even had sex with her, but you've already committed adultery. He's saying, hey, the standard is very big. You cannot meet it on your own. That's what Jesus was communicating. You need the grace of God. And he was saying this. Jesus even said, people can only enter the kingdom of heaven if they are even better than the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the best of the best religiously in the world of that day. They knew their Bible inside and out. They knew everything. They were so good in obeying the laws of God. They made sure they even tithed from their gardens. When there was lemons, they counted the lemons and gave a tenth. When there was, when there was herbs, they checked the herbs, they measured it and gave a tenth. They made sure that they were in no contravention to the law of God. Yet they were so far from seeing the grace of God in Jesus. In Isaiah, it's worded this way in the message. It's like putting perfume on a corpse. All our efforts, it's like putting perfume on a dead body. Makes no difference. No difference in the sight of God. And so we can be religious. We can be righteously religious or like, um, uh, yeah, what's the word? Religiously self-righteous where we live according to God's law and His word. And we've grown up a certain way and always fulfill it. But even if we don't know God, we can be self-righteous by these attempts like, being decent to other people in social causes, in political involvement, or being a good steward of the environment. And all those are good, but we do that in order to justify ourselves. Paul is here with a big brushstroke saying, hey, everyone's included, sorry for you, we're all dead. We're all sinners. We're all going to suffer God's judgment. We all pursue our own wills. We're all under the wrath of God. We're all in a hopeless situation needing an intervention. If we're dead, we can't do anything about being dead. And so some things about grace I want to talk about today. The first thing is this. Grace is given freely. If we realize we need it, guess what? It's free. It's free. Verse 8 says, God saved you by His grace. Mark Driscoll and Jerry Brashear says this. Grace is the victory Jesus achieved for us on the cross because there is no logical reason. There is actually no logical reason that God would love us and die in our place to free us from sin and death other than His nature. Because that's who God is. He's gracious. Any of you willing to die for someone who doesn't deserve it? That God did. And the message is put it this way. Saving was all his idea. It means he initiated it. It was his plan. Why? Because in verse 4 it says, because he loves us dearly. Because he loves us. Because of his love for us. He was justified. He was, had every right to punish us. Yet he chose to withhold punishment so to restore relationship. The best picture I can provide for you today is the picture that Jesus painted. When the Pharisees came to him and said, how can you hang out with these sinners, these prostitutes, these people far from God? How can you even eat with them, these unclean people? And Jesus responded by telling three stories. The story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, the story of the lost son. That was his response to that judgment by the Pharisees. We see that contrary to the religious culture of the day, we see that a God that seeks out the lost sheep, the lost coin, and even provides a way for the undeserving sinner. We see a father, though justified to reject his lost son and saying, you've squandered, you don't deserve to come into relationship with me, remain a slave. You can live on the out part of the land there on the far edge. You can do what you need to do and serve your penance for the rest of your life and die a slave. But yet the father celebrates him, runs to him, accepts him, identifies him as son. That is contrary to what was the culture of the day. He was saying things like you were dead, now you're found. He was describing the celebration in heaven that God has when we come to Him. God and his bu- is in the business of rescue and restoring relationship with Him, no matter how bad our sin. And the Father freely gives grace towards the Son. And the second thing I want you to understand is that grace comes at a great cost. In verse 4, it speaks about that He gave His life when He raised Christ. He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It's by God's grace that we have been saved. So grace is free for us. If it wasn't free and we earned it, it wouldn't be grace, would it? It would be works. And then we would be measured by our abilities and we'd be comparing ourselves. You know, we'd look like prefects with all our scrolls on our blazer. How many scrolls do you have? You only have one. Shame. Shame. You have 15. Wow, that's amazing. You're so spiritual. We do that anyway, don't we? Look at the guy on stage. He must have his life together. Really? Grace is free. The point is, is it cannot be earned. It cannot be earned. Though it is free to us, it was given at a cost by the giver. Timothy Keller puts it this way. Forgiveness always comes at a cost to the one offering forgiveness. That's why for us we struggle to forgive because there's a cost to forgive. But you know when you forgive, there's freedom for you. 
Freedom is far better than living in the space of bondage of unforgiveness in your life. The cost was Jesus paying the penalty on our behalf so to satisfy the just requirements of the law. This is something people struggle with. We like that God's loving, yes? Okay, no one likes that. Okay, then we can end the service right now. God's loving, yes? We like that he's gracious. We like that he's merciful. But we struggle when we see him as judge. How can a loving God judge? But he's also righteous and he's just. We like it when God is just to the people who have been unjust to us. Not so? We don't like it when God is just to us. That is called self-justification. We always think we're better than someone else. It's part of our nature. It's part of our sinful nature. It's part of that evil heart that Paul's talking about. We always think we're better and deserving when actually we're not. So God finds a way to pay the penalty for our sin by his son paying the price, not by sweeping sin under the carpet. So, because we like that. We'll be gracious. We sweep sin under the carpet. No, no. We deal with it justly and then we embrace and correct and restore. But we want to sweep sin under the carpet because we think that's what God does. No, no. He paid for it at a great cost. And so often when we don't understand that grace was at a great cost, we don't value it. And so we mistreat it and we treat it cheaply like a rental, you know, because it's not yours. You can drive it as you want, you know. Do you get what I'm saying? Something cheap. And when grace is cheap, we don't actually appreciate it and we don't walk in it and we don't share it and we're not gracious towards others. Not so. Consider the great cost. In the parable, the father gives the inheritance to his son. So in order for the youngest son to walk off with the inheritance, he had to divide two-thirds to the oldest, one-third to the youngest. So the oldest son knew what he was going to inherit. The youngest son returns and the father puts a ring, a cloak, kills a fat and cloth, calf. Whose inheritance does that come out of? The eldest son was at the eldest son's expense for the youngest son to be welcomed back into the family. This makes the eldest son angry. And why? Because he's thinking, why does this immoral son get rewarded? Yet I have been so good. I've obeyed my father. I get no reward. And his father says, but everything I have is yours. Meaning you're getting everything. What do you mean you have no reward? You're getting everything. But he was angry. How could you? How could you accept him back for what he did? Does that sound familiar? How can we let those dirty people into this church? You know, look at them. Well, maybe you don't say it. We think it. Come on, tell the truth. Yeah. And so we go on about, and this elder brother didn't want to welcome his brother. And the illustration is this, is that the first two stories, Jesus tells of people going to find the lost thing. Hey, the sheep, the coin. No one went to go find the lost brother. Because the implication was the oldest brother should have gone to find him. And he was saying, hey, you Pharisees, you know the law. You should be the one rescuing these people. Come on. He was saying that to them. He was saying that to them. And so we too, like the eldest son and the Pharisees, we can judge the immoral person in our fellowship, in our church, not so, but our standards of righteousness. Oh, they, look at them. Mm, mm, I don't want to mix with them, you know. Come on, we do that in our thinking. We lack grace, don't we? But as a church, we are a grace-filled church, aren't we? We are gracious to people. We are gracious when the parking lot attendants tell us where to park, amen? Why? Because we exist, Sundays exist for those who are not here yet. And so we create space for those who are not here yet. And we're gracious towards those people. We're gracious to the ushers who tell us where to sit, amen? Because they're creating room for those who are not here yet. They don't want us to be interrupted in our worship. Not so? It's very quiet in here, but we're gracious. We need to operate in grace. If we receive great grace, we too need to be offering of that grace towards others. Come on, come on. I'm going to wake you up this morning. Hey, we need to be more gracious towards one another. The third thing is this. It's not gained by works. Grace is not gained by works. Verse 8, God saved you by His grace. When you believed, and you can't take credit for this, it's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. In the Passion Translation, it says, No one will ever be able to boast for salvation. is never a reward for good works or human striving. We strive, don't we? We strive to find our sense of purpose. We strive for our identity. And nothing ever will help us because we're just a dead corpse, but we try and force it in our own ability. And so Paul is speaking to our nature and says, we're always trying to be self-righteous, but nothing will be enough. Nothing, nothing, nothing will be enough. 
It's a set of things we often want to do. And religion says do. Do, 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 and you'll be accepted. Do this, do this, do this, and you'll be accepted. Jesus said done on the cross. It is finished. And we forget that. And we move from a place of accepting done. And we go back to do, 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 do. And then we put do, do, do's on people. Hey? We expect all this doing to be done. This puts us all at a level playing field. Paul's saying, hey, guess what? We all enter the kingdom of the heaven on equal footing. No one earns it. So we're all equal. All equal in the kingdom of heaven. No one is more righteous than the other. The works we do now is the overflow of grace. God invites us to join him in his work in seeking and saving the lost. And so we get to accept the grace and then share the grace with those around us. Grace saves us. Grace trains us. Grace empowers us. And then grace gives us a purpose. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved for works. Works of grace. But it's easy for us to use these more moral scorecards which draws us away from a relationship with Jesus. We can keep track of what we've done and achieved compared to so-and-so, compared to so-and-so. And And Jesus actually addresses this in the parable about our self-righteousness by telling us about the elder brother who gets angry because of his personal loss and the father's grace to the younger brother. The father goes out to beg the older brother to come into the party. He says, come son, why are you out here? Why are you angry? Join us, celebrate with me. Don't you understand me? You've been with me the most. You should know what I'm about. This is what I'm about. Yet the oldest brother was angry. He would not. He says, I've always obeyed you. You know what the oldest brother's sin was? It wasn't because he was immoral. It's not because he did dirty things. His sin was that he placed value on his work. And so he was proud. And pride created a barrier between him and the father. The son thought that by staying and doing what was expected, he could control the father. Don't we do that? When things, bad things happen in our lives, we say, God, how could you let this happen to me? I have served you since 19, foot sack. I've done this, and I've done this for you, and I've done this for you. How can you, God? Don't we do that? That's pride. We think we can control God if we fulfill the check boxes. We've never realized that, have we? But we do that. We expect God to fulfill things according to our expectations. And the reality is this, it's so easy for us to identify with the immoral brother, the one who went out into the world and did all the dodgy stuff. And it's easy to identify those kinds of people, but it's so hard to identify the proud older brother amongst ourselves and in the mirror. John Ortberg said this, one of the hardest things in the world is to stop being the prodigal son without turning into the elder brother. The fourth thing in the worship team can come up. It's a gift to be received. Grace is a gift to be received. Verse 8 says it's a gift from God. It's not a gift from me or Ed. It's a gift from God. This is something we need to understand. We cannot be saved by association, by membership to a church. We cannot be saved by our birth in a Christian family or our Christian upbringing. We cannot be saved by exposure to Christianity or by osmosis. Best way for me to explain it to you is, if you were born in a garage, does that make you a car? If you were born in McDonald's, does that make you a hamburger with a side of fries? Yet we think that if I grew up in a Christian family, therefore I should be Christian. Christianity comes when we accept the grace of God through faith. God has children, sons and daughters, not grandchildren not foreign cousins or relatives from far away. He has children whom he has relationship with. And we cannot assume association with God by our membership and coming here without accepting his grace and saying, I place faith in your work for me. That is what makes us Christian. It's a gift that needs to be received. This is a nice gift. You've been all looking at it and I saw you guys eyeing it out. It's not for you, okay? But it was given to me yesterday. It's a really beautiful box, a pretty ribbon. It was really nice. And there was not even a a note in it, but we were kind of like surprised by it. But this is a great gift, not so. The thing is with a gift, it has to be received. It has to be received. We can sing about the gift. We can stand next to the gift. We can look at the gift. We can even come to church and hear about the gift and talk about the gift and celebrate the gift and sing about the gift. But until I open it, it means nothing. Until I receive this grace, It means nothing. We receive this wonderful gift of salvation by His grace, through faith, in trusting, accepting His gift. We do this by realizing our nature, our broken nature, our sinful nature, our nature where we need to be judged. And we realize that we need this water badly. We need this grace badly. And without God, 
we have no hope. And then we agree with God saying, God, I agree. You say I am this, I am. I'm tired of lying, tired of pretending, tired of trying to make myself self-justified by my behavior. God, I am bad. Would you forgive me? Could you take this away from me? It's a gift, not a right. It's a gift, not a right. And sometimes we become the Pharisees where it becomes a right that we have the power to dispense grace or withhold grace. No, it's a gift. 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 It should never be taken for granted. And in turn, will you and I be willing to dispense this grace to others? Would we embrace with love first before we point a figure of judgment? In the parable, the young son accepted the father's gift of grace and entered the celebration clothed and identified as son rather than a slave and a sinner. Do you know that son could have argued with his father and said, no, I'm choosing to be a slave. I reject your offer and go and live in the shed outside. He chose to accept the gift. The elder brother refused to accept the same grace offered to him. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and he says, sometimes the sinners are more readily receive salvation because... They know they're bad and they know what they did, but the deception of pride keeps the moral son out of fellowship with the father. And so he's like, no, I'm not going to go into fellowship with you. No, I'm going to stand by my position. That person doesn't deserve it, but yet you are removing yourself from relationship and fellowship with the father. And Jesus was saying, you know what? Those other parables, someone came to find him. I'm here now. I'm the good elder brother. I've come to find you. I'm here. I'm here. I came for you. I came for you. Would you come into the celebration with the Father and enter a relationship? Because I came for you. You a lost son too. Though you think you got it together, you a lost son too. I came for you. And so often we mistrust God. And so when we mistrust God, we respond like either brother. Either we go on our own way and say like, I don't trust this God thing. I don't trust this Christianity thing. I'm going to do my own thing. Or the other response is I'll be religious as possible so that I can control with pride. Knowing that I have a guarantee. Know that my life is together. It's the same problem there's a third option though isn't that good to know there's a third option when we look to Jesus as the perfect other brother who willingly sacrifices himself out of selfless love he wasn't forced to do it the father didn't like just rob him and say sorry tough luck son I'm gonna I'm gonna do it no no Jesus willingly went to the cross for you and me he comes looking for us and it breaks the mistrust and fear in our minds and when we realize that there are no strings attached but rather a deep desire to have relationship with us then we can willingly enter relationship with God the Father. There's no catch. John Newton put it this way in another hymn centuries ago. Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen His beauty, are joined to part no more. William Coper in his hymn said, To see the law by Christ fulfilled, and hear His pardoning voice, changes slave into a child and duty into choice. I want to close with a story. It's called Because I Am Yours. And it comes out of a book titled Proof. It's an excerpt of that. And it says this. I've never dreamt that taking a child to Disney World could be so difficult or that such a trip could teach me so much about God's outrageous grace. Our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family. I, Timothy, am sure this couple had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. After a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption and we ended up welcoming an eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them, but they left their adopted daughter with a family friend. Usually, at least in the child's mind, this happened because she didn't, did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World. She had heard about the rides and the characters and the parades. But when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one left on the outside. Once I thought, uh, uh, found out about this history, I made plans to, make, to take her to Disney World. The next time, a speaking engagement took our family to the southeastern United States. I thought I'd mastered the Disney World drill. I knew from previous experiences that the prospect of seeing cast members in freakishly oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow turns children to squirming bundles of emotional instability. What I didn't expect was that the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to the, our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk her through her latest escapade. 
I know what you're going to do, she said fatly. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test several times before, so she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear to my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But by God's grace, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, brown eyes wide, tear rimmed. You are part of this family? Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Sure, there may be some consequences to, uh, to help you remember what's right and wrong, but you're part of our family and we're not leaving you behind. I'd like to say that her behaviors grew better after that moment. They didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we headed to Disney World on the day we had promised, and it was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, and lots of lines mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. In a hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive, and a little weepy at times, but her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and asked her, how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes, snuggled down into her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. And that's the message of outrageous grace. Outrageous grace isn't a favor you can achieve by being good. It's the gift you receive by being God's. Outrageous grace is God's goodness that comes looking for you when you have nothing but a middle finger flipped in the face of God to offer in return. It's a farmer paying a full day's wages to a crew of deadbeat date laborers who only have a single hour punched on their time cards. It's a man marrying an abandoned woman and then refusing to forsake his covenant with her when she turns out to be a whore. It's the insanity of a shepherd who puts 99 sheep at risk to rescue the single lamb that's too stupid to stay with a flock. It's the love of a father who hands over his finest rings and robes to a young man who has squandered his inheritance on drunken binges with his fair weather friends. It's, uh, it's one way love that calls you into the kingdom not because you've been good but because God has chosen you and made you his own and now he's chasing you to the ends of the earth to keep you as his child and nothing in heaven or hell will stop him. But this, this is what's amazing about God's outrageous grace. This isn't merely what God the Father would do. It's what he did do. God could have chosen to save anyone, everyone, or no one from Adam's fallen race. But what God did was to choose a multi-hued multitude of someones. And if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, one of those someones was you. God in Christ has declared over you, I could have chosen anyone in the whole world as my child, and I chose you. No matter what you say or do, whether my love, neither, neither my love nor my choice will ever change. That's grace. That's truly amazing. Paul states it this way in Titus, and I'm closing. But when God our Savior revealed His kindness and love, He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. And because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Let's pray. I want to give you this opportunity. If you've heard this message today about grace, and maybe you're in this place where you've been far from God for a long time. Maybe you've been coming for a while and you've never made a decision for Jesus. Maybe you realize, oh, I'm like that older brother. I've always just done the right thing, but I've never come to know God. I don't know God. I don't have a relationship with God. I want to give you an opportunity today to pray a simple prayer of faith to receive what God has for you. You can pray in your hearts and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for paying the price for all my sin. Come into our heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. I open my heart and my life to you in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, no one's looking around, but I want to acknowledge you. If you pray that prayer this morning, won't you raise your hand so I can acknowledge you? Anyone like that this morning? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. How many more? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Fantastic, fantastic. Let's stand, let's praise God and thank God for those people who've made a decision this morning.